Today, we are talking about pancreatic cancer. So pancreatic cancer is a little tricky. The reason it's tricky is because most of these patients present as big bird, bright yellow skin, bright yellow eyes, and then with that workup, they are found to have pancreatic cancer. Instead of starting with what is it, we're actually gonna start with the anatomy because that will explain a lot of the symptoms that people have. This is the biliary tree, so you can see the liver, gallbladder, duodenum, and pancreas. If you present with a pancreatic mass in the tail of your pancreas, you usually don't have symptoms and the problem with this is these are usually found incidentally because they don't have any symptoms. You might have vague abdominal pain, you might have pain when you eat, but for the most part, there are really no symptoms. Strangely enough, these we can find early enough to where we can do a distal pancreatectomy, remove them, and they're fine. The one that you always worry about is a mass in the head of the pancreas. There's so much going on here because the biliary tree is coming in here, the pancreatic duct's coming in here, your duodenum swings around, that once you get a big mass right here, you block all of these. So you can have difficulty eating because food won't go past your duodenum. You can have, you turn yellow because this bile duct, the green thing, is blocked off. So the bile, instead of being excreted in the bile duct into your duodenum, it gets it blocks off and it kind of leaks out through your liver. Sometimes they present as acute cholecystitis because it fills your gallbladder up and people complain of right upper quadrant pain, right upper quadrant abdominal pain. You also get light stools because this bile is not dumping into your duodenum to make your stools brown. So your stools are actually clay colored, sometimes white. This is also why pancreatic cancer is a big deal because right behind here, there are a couple of arteries that feed the rest, the entire GI tract, your SMA. Superior mesenteric artery, if you have a blockage there or it surrounds it, you get intestinal angina. But if you surround it completely, you may not be resectable. Portal veins over here, it usually doesn't block the portal vein. It kind of causes, it can push down on it. So you can have some weird venous stuff going on as well. The biggest problem with a pancreatic cancer when it occurs right here is you got to take all this out. And we'll kind of talk about what a Whipple is at some point. Now, so first we're going to go through exactly what pancreatic cancer is and what are some of the risk factors. But again, these are not risk factors that most people would traditionally modify because of pancreatic cancer. They're risk factors that you try to avoid for a host of other reasons. Coronary artery disease, um, carotid artery disease, strokes, stuff like that. The things that cause those problems also put you at risk for pancreatic cancer. Now, on a pancreatic cancer. Malignant growth of cells in the pancreas, ductal adenocarcinoma is the most common. There are other types of pancreatic cancer that are endocrine in origin, but we're not talking about those. We're specifically talking about adenocarcinoma in this lecture. The rest of them are super rare, associated with some syndromes. We're not worried about that right now. Fourth leading cause of cancer-related death in the United States. The interesting thing about this fact is about 26,000 people a year are diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and about 26,500 people die of it. Weird numbers, but people die from pancreatic cancer and we didn't know they had pancreatic cancer at all, and more people die of it than are diagnosed with it, so it's a little weird. Again, these risk factors, smoking, obesity, heavy drinking, diabetes, genetic issues, chronic pancreatitis, these are all things that you try to avoid, but you really can't. If you're smoking, you're smoking. When they present, it's usually abdominal pain that's vague, jaundice, yellow eyes, yellow skin, losing a significant amount of weight because by the time you're symptomatic, you usually are metastatic. So the cancer is using up more calories than you're absorbing, that's why you lose weight. Or this migratory thrombophlebitis. Essentially, if you have cancer, what will happen is you are more likely to have thrombosis of, of veins, or any arteries, but veins primarily, 
that kind of causes some backup of the veins in your legs and you can get this thrombophlebitis inflammation. That's one of the risk factors. It's not a risk factor for cancer, but if you see it, it may be a sign of a cancer that is of unknown origin. So you need to get that worked up. As far as the lab, elevated bilirubin, alphos, mild anemia, and a CAT scan usually shows a solid mass. Most pancreatic cancers are not confused for pseudocyst because the pseudocysts are cystic. They are solid masses in the pancreas. Those typically, if we can't tell you exactly what it is or what it's from, you're gonna have surgery. That's it, I think this is the quickest we've gone through this section. So the next question is, you come into the emergency room, you come into your primary care doctor's office, they see that you're yellow, they get a laboratory complete metabolic panel to check your bilirubin to see if it's elevated. Once it's elevated, the next step, nine times out of 10, is a CAT scan. You can do other tests, but usually this starts with a CAT scan and like I said, often it happens in the emergency room because we didn't expect this to happen. It's very rare. With regards to the diagnosis, we talked about the labs, we talked about abdominal CT. Now, this is where it gets tricky. ERCP, MRCP. ERCP is done in a GI lab. MRCP is a MRI with contrast. EUS, endoscopic ultrasound, fine needle aspirate. We'll start at the end and come back. Fine needle aspirations of pancreatic cancers only done when someone is not resectable. What that essentially means is we will take people to the operating room without a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer and assume that they have pancreatic cancer and put them through one of the largest operations that we do in general surgery, probably in surgery outside transplants and abdominal aortic aneurysms. We do this because if you start doing fine needle aspirations, the pancreas, you can take a patient that's not metastatic and turn them into a metastatic patient. The head of the pancreas has so much stuff going on that you are more likely to injure something than you are to actually get a good diagnosis. And if they tell me you have pancreatic cancer and you're resectable on CT scan, I'm still going to do an operation. If they don't know if it's pancreatic cancer, they do an FNA and it says non-diagnostic or just normal tissue and you still are symptomatic because your bilirubin is elevated, you may have some tumor markers, I'm still doing a Whipple on you, you're still getting surgery. So the only time we do a FNA for pancreatic cancer is if we see lesions in the liver, lesions in the lung, lesions other places, and we biopsy those first and then it comes back at no carcinoma, or you are unresectable for other reasons like you medically just cannot tolerate this operation and we're gonna do chemotherapy and, re chemotherapy and not do surgery, then you would do an FNA. So an FNA is not something we routinely need or even do for pancreatic cancer. If I do a Whipple procedure on you for a mass in the head of the pancreas and it is not cancer, you still needed a Whipple because you were still symptomatic because it was blocking certain, uh, like we talked about the liver and everything else, so you need to get it done. MRCP is a good test to look at the biliary tree. It is okay as a screening test for somebody that has an elevated bilirubin when their CT scan is usually normal. MRCPs and ERCPs are you often used when we don't see a mass in on CT scan or in the head of the pancreas or the body of the pancreas, and we're worried about them having a primary bile duct tumor. That is what this is for, not to diagnose pancreatic cancer, but to make sure this is not a bile duct tumor masquerading as a pancreatic cancer because it's got your bilirubin elevated. ERCP is also used to put stents in, we'll talk about that later, but putting a stent in to bypass that biliary tree so that they get patients get a symptomatic relief. But this has consequences if they're gonna have surgery that we'll have to talk about at some point, plus or minus. Now, management. You come into two categories, you're either resectable and you get a pancreatectomy because you don't have metastasis, you don't have 
disease surrounding the superior mesenteric artery. You don't have disease growing into or up to the portal vein, although sometimes you can cut that out kind of, sort of, and close it up. But there's, if there's no way to get a negative margin, you then have to start saying you're non-resectable. The whole goal of this operation is to be able to get all of the cancer cells that we can see out. That will give you a 10% five-year survival. If we leave disease, you fall into the 90%. If you are non-resectable by having distal metastasis, by having an, an organ involved that we can't resect, like the aorta, like the SMA or something like that, SMV, you then have to go through neoadjuvant treatment, biliary stenting, that's the ERCP, and sometimes we'll do bypasses. So we'll do a gastrojejunostomy, sewing the stomach and the small intestine together to bypass the uh, duodenum altogether so you can eat. Sometimes people do what's called a colidoco jejunostomy when you sew part the intestine up to the biliary tree to divert the bilirubin if you can't get a stent. But that's when we start talking about bypassing. Um, a palliative Whipple procedure is not really a thing, but people still do it. Now, these are the options for operation. ERCP, endoscopic retrograde cholangial pancreatography. The reason this is controversial, it is used for therapeutic management of a pancreatic biliary disorders. So if you have a blockage somewhere on this green line, you can put a stent that is really just a straight, it's not like a stent for a heart uh, cath. It is basically a little plastic tube, looks like a straw with curly ends on both sides. And it goes in here and it allows the bile to drain into the duodenum. Patients with pancreatic cancer, they usually almost always have a blockage of their biliary tree and their biliary tree is really large and dilated. So putting a stent in does help them with symptoms, but not a lot. The problem with putting a stent in for, before you do a Whipple procedure or distal pancreas or removing that mass in the head of the pancreas is there's pretty good evidence that shows that the patients that have bile stents have a higher infection rate and a higher complication rate than those that don't have them. So from a surgical standpoint, we would say don't put a stent in. The problem is most of these patients are managed by their primary doctor, the ER, and they call GI first. GI usually puts a stent in because again, it's obstruction. They would think that's what they'll do. And they don't realize that we don't need a lot of workup to take these patients to the operating room. If you have a CT scan, full set of labs, cardiac clearance, which you can all get when just about every hospital within 24 hours, you can take an operating room within 24 hours. We don't need to send them home and do it as an outpatient. We will do it as an inpatient procedure. Now, if they put a stent in, then fine, we can take time, make sure the nutrition and everything is great, but it's not necessary. I am a fan of not putting stents in. It does make the surgery a little easier, especially if you don't know how to do the surgery, you don't need a biliary stent. I know how to do the surgery. Now, outside of putting stents in, you have two options. You have what's called a distal pancreatectomy or pancreatic duodenectomy. Distal pancreatectomy just means if you have a tumor right here, you just go cut it out, remove it. Sometimes you remove the spleen and that's it. You're done. That's a distal pancreatectomy. You can staple it off, put a drain in. You don't have to sew intestine to it or do anything else. Staple across it, move on. That's not the most common. The most common is a mass right here. So you can imagine in order to get a negative margin, you've got to cut a lot of stuff out. So you essentially, I'm gonna remove my old pancreas thing here. So you essentially have to cut out the bile duct part of the stomach, because remember the stomach kind of attaches up here, the entire duodenum head of the pancreas. So you are essentially cutting out this block of tissue, okay? When you do that, you have to check your biliary margin. You have to check your pancreatic margin. You have to check your gastric margin to make sure you don't have any positive margins. Remember, the goal of this operation is to not have a positive margin. Once your margins are all negative, 
then you start talking about reconstruction. I'm going to draw this out, but I will show you a pretty, a much better picture. Although I should make Christine come draw it out since she draws better than me. But essentially what you have left is your stomach over here. Okay. You have a little bit of pancreas here. And you have your liver here. Okay. So you have three structures hanging out and you got to figure out how to put them together. Now, remember you had this small intestine that you transected before. So there are a couple different ways to do this. You essentially can bring everything, a loop of bowel up and sew it this way, okay? In order to do that, you have to make sure you do what's called a pylorus sparing Whipple procedure. The problem with the pylorus sparing Whipple procedure is some people argue that that's not a anatomic surgery, but if you save the pylorus, you don't have to worry about the bile and the pancreatic juices coming back in the stomach and causing problems. Now, if you don't do a pylorus preserving uh, operation and you just do, you are a believer in an anatomic resection. I am not. You do what's called a Roux-en-Y bypass. So you then have a loop of intestine that goes up to the stomach and all your food drains this way. You have this blind loop of intestine that goes up and connects into the biliary tree and into the pancreas. So all your digestive enzymes come here and meet here. This is the most common way that it is done. Um, it adds one more anastomosis that has to, has to be done.